Hello, I am Katrick and today I'm making this video for the Construct2 Academy. This project is about cutscenes. We have a game level layout where we control a character. You can see that it has also a camera and some uh, strange pink area on the right. When we press the key F1, the camera and the area disappears, are hidden. For our purpose, I will let them visible for now. When the character touch a trigger's area, a cinematic cutscene using the game's engine kicks in and then gives back the hand to the player. While the, the camera was moving, I couldn't move my character and now I can move it again. You can see on the right the second trigger area enter in collision with it and now I'm not touching my keyboard actually. It has moved itself. The NPC has put some words, some animation, some text and now I can move again. You can notice that I can go through the former triggers without reactions to them and on the right currently some crates are blocking my way. So what I can do is go through the door uh, by pressing the down key and this will take me to another dedicated layout to cut scenes using the same kind of engine uh, or dedicated sprite animations and so on. So you can notice also the fade in fade out. Hey, this is another type of cutscene, another layout. It has all been automatic. And now we are back on the level layout. You can notice that the NPC and the lever has disappeared as well as the crates. Now there is a sign. Another trigger area. And this is the end of the level animation. Let's see now how the project is set up. First of all, our project is made of three layouts. The first is named Title Screen, and it is done so that it has a fade layer, which is of parallax 00, zero and which is global, and it contains a fade object. This is for the fade ins and fade outs. The only purpose of the title screen at this moment, it will just go to the game layout directly, send you directly to the game layout, it's just for the sake of the layer right now. So we have the game where most of our level happens. So as you can see, a character sprite, which is using the platform behavior bound to layout, the timer behavior as well, a separated object camera, for inputs, I do have a keyboard object. I'm using also the function. And uh, we're basically using sprites and sprite fonts uh, and using several behaviors. So fade, platform, timer. The camera there, as I was saying, is using the scroll to behavior and it's separated from the character even though at times it is placed at the same layout position giving the focus of the view of the character and that is about everything some some sprites do have animations different animations walk action the lever there is a single action but by default the speed of the animation is set to zero and change automatically during the, the cinematic, the, the cutscene. So the theory is to have a trigger zone in the editor, which is basic sprite, which will be invisible, but used to check whether a character arrives at a certain location in certain circumstances and triggers the cinematic. At that moment, we block, prevents the inputs from the player. And to do so, when we go into the ES game event sheet, which is the main event sheet for the game layout, you can notice that there is a group input that contains all my player's inputs. And 
a character on collision with trigger and one of the things that is done most of the time is to deactivate the input group. I've separated in different steps uh, what happens uh, depending on the trigger because this way you can have a total control and if in some cinematic you don't want to remove the input of the player for some reason you can and uh, the basic the theory is to set a couple of values we set the cinematic boolean variable of the camera to true and the cinematic step value to what number of cinematic or cutscene we are currently and then in this event camera is cinematic depending on the number something happens differently and as you can see it's plentifully commented. What is called the finite state machine. Consider the execution time with events and value so that the cinematic knows what it is, what it should do. So for example, when we have hit the first trigger, a cinematic takes the camera object up until it's at position X 1200 and uh, until it is it is still moving to the right and once it has hit that position it's set to the position and a timer kicks in. Another type of cutscene is a cutscene that happens in a dedicated layout. At some point in the game layout when we go through the door there and this is down in the down arrow there. The theory behind having uh, new layout cutscenes. On start of layout in your level or game layout you do have some check to see whether it is the first execution or coming back from a cinematic layout. So I do have this back from cutscene which is by default zero as a value when it starts when it's first executed. So as long as back from cutscene is zero, this is not executed. Then a trigger or an input happens. So our done arrow is pressed, which sets back from cutscene to one and sets a fade in. And once the fade in is finished, the game state is saved to a slot. So that's using the system expression load and save. You can see about those in the manual. And we go to the cutscene layout. And uh, you can see that I've made a mistake right there. So cutscene. We go to the cinematic layout, which has its own code, its own event sheet, that has its own happening. The, uh, so it's pretty much like another finite state machine, which will have some objects do some things and move on the screen to a certain extent. You do have a dedicated cutscene layout. And once the cutscene is done, you go back to the game layout. And going back to the game layout, Again, we do have a check on the start of layout, but this time, as mentioned, back from cutscene value is different from zero. So we load some game states, and as it happens, when the load is complete, and that the value is equal to a certain amount, in this case I just have one cutscene, which is back from cutscene one, but I could have a second or another, but when I'm coming back from the cutscene of value 1. I do have certain elements that I remove, so the crates are destroyed, the NPC, the lever, the door is set to be closed again, and so on. And I will ultimately give back the hand to the player during the in the set fade, when the fade out is finished, the group input is activated again. Anytime you want to give back the hand to your player, you pretty much set the group input to activate it again. On top of cinematics, we also have uh, fade in and fade out, as we have seen, and it is handled in a an, an common event sheet that is included in the cutscene as well as in the game event sheet. It's ES fade, which will set the fade 
So some fade in or some fade out accordingly. Actually at the moment fade is a little square but thanks to set fade we set its position and size to cover the whole window and accordingly if we are doing a fade in or a fade out we set its opacity to 0 or to 100 and we restart either the fade in or the fade out because it has a fade in and a fade out it's two fade behaviors but which are configured differently to have different purpose and on fade out or on fade in finished we call a function and the function is actually implemented in the including event sheet there fade out finished fade in finished and it has the same function in the ES cutscene as well named the very same way but they aren't opposing they they will this one will execute when it's the cutscene layout and this one will actually execute when it's the game layout so that's the theory behind the fade in and fade out behavior moreover during the fades themselves you want to block the execution of the game the inputs the cinematics etc to make sure that the fade is finished and then you are executing what you want to show you to your player it's just the fade is just a transition between layouts and it's quite an easy way to automate it I will come back to the finite state machine I was talking about earlier because it's it's really important so it's mainly in this event as mentioned in theory you need a finite state machine to help with your cinematics execution seeing how events work in construct 2 that means that they are read from top to bottom and whenever all the conditions of an event are true the action and sub events of this event are tested and executed to build such a machine you need to consider the execution time and uh, fragment it in different states and that's what I did there using the cinematic step global variable and using it in addition with the boolean variable cinematic on the camera object so first of all whenever the camera cinematic boolean variable is set to true then we are going to check at what cinematic step we currently are what kind of cutscene I'm expecting to display to the player and for example when cinematic step is 1 event 7 it is supposed to handle the camera moving from the character up to the X position 1200 in the layout in the first time the camera has to reach the X position so as long as it is not there we move the camera frame by frame and that is done by using the DT system expression delta time you can see there is a tutorial which explains exactly what it is supposed to be once we have reached the position or even gone beyond it we place the camera to the set position and we start a timer and as it is triggered once from that moment on there's nothing happening for 1.5 seconds the logical execution from now on is down there and the came back timer so event 49 after 1.5 seconds we change the value of cinematic step to 2 so this event we are done with and we step to this one which is the camera coming back from where it is to the character and it is pretty much in the same order of idea of what we have done in the first step we check that the camera's x is greater than the character dot x position as long as it is we remove some x from the position and once it has reached or is on the left of the character we set the camera directly to the character's position and after a while we just hand back and this is a timer we use several times we hand back the input to the players so we activate the input group again and we set the cinematic boolean variable value to false and that's about it you can see in the capex different ways to delay the execution of something using timers fade behavior 
animations ends of the sprite object itself or when manually moving an object or using actions from the used behaviors to do so. Expecting to reach out a certain position and its counterpart using a trigger once while true system condition to end the movement once the object got there. At some point I'm using the simulate action for the platform behavior. In the end it is up to you to set any condition that makes sense for your game and the current cinematic and or game sequence. Be sure to thoughtfully organize a project and what it needs to do on a story and mechanic basis. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Don't hesitate to check out some of the other Constructor Academy material. Thank you for watching.